Good morning. Our first item of business today is general questions. To try and get as many people as possible, I would prefer short and succinct questions and answers to match. Question number one, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the Scottish Government what the timetable is for the Good Food Nation Bill and whether it will include addressing the health implications of multibuys? Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, work has begun to prepare a consultation that will inform the content of the Good Food Nation Bill. Decisions on the Bill timetable will be taken in the context of the Government's overall legislative programme. The content of the Bill will be informed by the outcome of the consultation and by any actions required to give effect to a range of Government priorities. Richard Lockhead. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that uh, many organisations such as the Scottish Food Coalition uh, and other organisations and many individuals are very keen for the Good Food Nation Bill to help transform our food culture in this country. And despite the fact that the, we have the beginnings of food revolution in this country in recent years, there's still much more to do in terms of tackling food poverty uh, and also obesity and other issues. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of Cancer Research UK's paper just in the last few days, which indicated that 40% of all calories are the, as a result of price promotions in our supermarkets in relation to unhealthy foods. And indeed, they also point out that seven in 10 Scottish adults support banning promotions of unhealthy foods in our supermarkets. Is this the kind of issue that he believes the, the bill can address? Or indeed, even better, is there any short-term action the Scottish Government can take to address that important issue? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member is quite right to, to raise the, the report. I have not myself studied it. Uh, I think it is within the purview of my colleague Aileen Campbell, who has responsibility for public health. And I know that she will, of course, take that matter very seriously. I did just last week, uh, presiding officer, meet with representatives of the Scottish Food Coalition to discuss their ideas for uh, inclusion in the bill. And I've also invited the Food Commission to provide advice to ministers on the bill. And I would welcome contributions from members across this House, from all parties, as I think this is really a great opportunity for Scotland to tackle measures relating to improving our nutrition and food health. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in, t in terms of multi, multi food buys, uh, of course, we would have to differentiate between the type of foods we don't want uh, people to eat and those that do, because we, would we be encouraging multi food buys across fruit and veg? And, and other uh, healthy foods and also within the Good Food Nation Bill will we be addressing the issue of public food procurement into our schools, food into our schools and hospitals and ensuring that local food is procured as wherever possible. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well uh, I think Mr Whittle in his former career as an international athlete is uh, well placed to be an advocate for uh, for good choices in, in dietary matters. And he's absolutely right, presiding officer, to, to raise the, these matters. They're taken very seriously by uh, all the uh, members of the Scottish Government. In relation to his second question, I recently convened the first summit uh, on food procurement uh, to ensure that as far as possible in the public sector, whether it be in our hospitals, in our schools, uh, in, in the government uh, and public uh, sector, areas, uh, sub public sector institutions as a whole, that we procure as much of our food locally as possible. And we've made considerable progress there and then over the last 10 years, I believe increasing the uh, take up of local produce from Scottish farmers and other primary producers by a very substantial mar margin. And that work is ongoing. Question number two, Mary Evans. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve access to transport for people in rural areas. Cabinet Secretary. We are committed to improving rural transport and this is reflected in our ambitious plans to dual both the A9 and the A96, major investments such as the Borders Railway and ongoing subsidies of over £1,000 million per annum for public transport and other sustainable options generally and periodic reviews of our legislation, strategies and policies, such as the current review of the National Transport Strategy. Mary Evans. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I asked this question because two weeks ago, one of the local bus services that runs from Brechin in my hometown and my constituency uh, to Montrose was cut. Now, this was a valuable service for people commuting for work, but also the service ran to Montrose Railway Station, which is on the main East Coast rail link between Aberdeen and London and ran at key times for commuters. Now, with rural communities also badly impacted by bank closures, the fact that all not, not all towns have things such as job centres, amongst other services, does the Scottish Government recognise the need to support and preserve rural transport links? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the member raises a number of issues, all of which are uh, absolutely essential for rural life and which are real problems for her constituents and others, and she is right to raise them. And yes, we do take this extremely seriously, and we, uh, we provide a subsidy for bus services through the Bus Service Operators Grant, uh, which is paid to operators to help keep fares down and for 2017-18, presiding officer, we've increased the budget to £53.5 million. So we do take this very seriously and a very substantial funding is made to help local rural transport in particular. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Uh, for older people in rural areas, community and charity buses are often the only direct link to health care and other vital services. So does the Minister support calls from this party to increase access to such services by extending the free bus pass scheme to community transport? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I certainly do recognise the, the uh, uh, substantial contribution that community bus services make. Uh, no more so, I believe, actually, than in the Strasbay area where the scheme is, I believe, presiding officer, an exemplar. Uh, and uh, we all would wish to see such schemes uh, a, a, a flourish uh, and continue as they do provide uh, a very useful service to a great many people in rural Scotland. So we do support the, the aims and aspirations behind the question and I'm very happy to consider any specific coherent policy suggestions which any member may have. Question number three, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps are being taken to improve safety at the Junction 21 slip road where the M74 joins the B7076. Cabinet Secretary Fergus King. Well, of course, safety is the top priority. We take our obligations very seriously. Following concerns raised, Presiding Officer, by Kilpatrick Community Council about the safety of this junction, a comprehensive safety review was carried out. Whilst the review concluded that the junction layout, road traffic signs and road markings are appropriate and that they comply with current design standards, a refurbishment of the road markings at the junction and the road traffic signs was completed in October last year with additional signage enhancements recently carried out. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, but given ongoing community concerns and a number of serious near misses at the junction, uh, will the Scottish Government commit to sending Transport Scotland officials down to look at the site and to meet with representatives from the local community councils? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm informed that in the last three full calendar years, um, presiding officer, there were two slight personal injury accidents, both in 2015 on the B7076 at the bottom of the junction 21 northbound offslip from the M74. Uh, now, I'm happy, of course, that uh, the member makes representations to my colleague, Mr. Youssef, who is primarily dealing with this, ma with this matter, and should he wish to make such representations, they will, of course, be taken, as they always are, very seriously indeed. I think it would be not unreasonable to make the point, however, that it is the responsibility of every driver to observe safe driving practice, and the prime responsibility must always rest with every single one of us to ensure that we drive safely on our roads. Question number four, Ben McPherson. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the UK Government's benefit cap will have on individuals and families in Scotland. Minister Jean Freeman. The latest DWP figures for February 2017 show that over 3,600 households and 11,000 children in Scotland are currently affected by the new cap two-thirds of whom are lone parents, and while the average weekly cut is £59, some households are having to cope with losing £200 each week. 
This is in increasing hardship and difficulty for already vulnerable households and children is unacceptable and the UK Government should reverse this policy. Ben McPherson. I welcome the, the Minister's comments there and I'm, I'm glad that she'll, she's joining with me to call on the UK Government to re, uh, reverse these cuts, especially given the damaging impact that they are having on communities, including in my constituency, particularly in North Edinburgh, where people and families and, and their children are facing increased hardship and in some cases homelessness due to the issues surrounding the benefit cap and other UK government welfare reforms. And can I ask the Minister what we can do together to put pressure on the UK government to reverse these cuts as she specified? Minister. I thank the member for that additional question. Of course, the benefit cap, as members will know from our previous statements in this chamber, is an issue that we are directly addressing uh, with the past UK government and will do with the incoming UK government with respect to its effect uh, as they intend to apply it to devolved benefits and the impact on individuals, an effect which we believe very strongly, firmly uh, undercuts the agreement in the Smith Commission and the fiscal framework. I'm very happy to advise the member that we uh, consistently uh, press the UK government to reverse policies which, uh, ironically, in a social security system that they operate, which assesses need, then chooses not to meet it. And having come this morning from a, a very helpful discussion with East Lothian Council on the impact uh, in their uh, members, their residents, and on that authority in terms of the full rollout of universal credit. I'm pleased to say that we are now looking to working very directly with our newly elected local authorities, with COSLA as it uh, forms itself under that, uh, those new regimes, in order to increase pressure collectively from Scotland to the UK government to reverse all of the changes that they have introduced, which evidence shows have a direct impact on uh, vulnerable families, on children in particular, and of course on women. Question number five, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. I uh, recently met the new Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, Jane Grant, on Thursday the 18th of May and we discussed matters of importance to local people. Mary Fee. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary held a small invite-only meeting in Paisley and was faced with strong opposition from local parents and members of the Kids Need Our Ward campaign, who are deeply worried and angry over the proposed closure of the children's ward at the town's Royal Alexandra Hospital. In addition to this, parents and families across Inverclyde are growing increasingly concerned about the downgrading of the Inverclyde Royal Hospital's midwife birthing unit. Local residents have vigorously opposed the proposed changes, with a 7,000 strong petition opposing the downgrading of the birthing unit. Ultimately, the final decision over the downgrading and closure of the children's ward at the RAH and the downgrading of the birthing unit at Inverclyde Royal Hospital lies with the Scottish Government. Will the Cabinet Secretary consider the anxiety and concern expressed by parents and families across West of Scotland and take decisive action to reverse the closure of the children's ward at the RAH in Paisley and the birthing unit at the Inverclyde Royal Hospital? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, can I say that I had a, a very productive meeting on the, the 19th of May with uh, local parents. Uh, who were able to express very directly themselves uh, the issues and concerns that they had. Uh, as I said to the, the parents at that meeting on the, the 19th of May, I would be happy to meet with uh, any other uh, local concerned parents. And indeed, uh, we made sure that my contact details were given to anybody who was taking part in the protest outside the meeting who wanted those contact details and we will uh, liaise with them and set up further meetings as required uh, in addition to uh, a visit that I will be making to the RH uh, Ward uh, 15 and of course as Mary Fee quite rightly says the decision does rest with me and it's quite right that I take a, a, a due process and hear those concerns uh, as part of that process and I will take time to do that in coming to 
to a decision about Ward 15 at the RAH. In regard to the Inverclyde birthing unit, as Mary Fee should know, uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde have been uh, undertaking their own review of uh, maternity and neonatal services within Greater Glasgow and Clyde and will be making a, a decision on their next steps based on uh, that review. Uh, so I think she's being a, a little pre preemptive uh, in suggesting that those proposals uh, are with me. Now, they are not, because Glasgow uh, have not uh, submitted any formal proposals to me around the birthing unit at Inverclyde. Uh, so we should allow Greater Glasgow and Clyde to undertake the work that they are undertaking about maternity uh, and neonatal services and uh, then uh, take, uh, let due process uh, go forward from there. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, Cam. Uh, uh, also, sorry. Uh, recently, the Government Telegraph uh, reported that employees and consultants uh, have been informally told that the ITU department, which caters uh, for patients at the IRH who need intensive treatment after operations will close in January, can the Cabinet Secretary uh, inform me of uh, if this issue was actually raised uh, with the Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and also uh, why then has there been no official dialogue from Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, the staff and elected representatives over current plans for the ITU department? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the, the member will be aware that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, responded uh, to uh, concerns, uh, confirming that there are uh, currently no proposals to alter the services delivered from the ITU at Inverclyde Royal Hospital and uh, I would expect all health boards uh, to undertake proper and meaningful engagement with local stakeholders in the shaping and delivery of healthcare services and local people can be assured that the NHS in Scotland uh, has well established uh, guidance on service change and it remains the case that any proposals designated as major change would have to be the subject of formal cons public consultation and ultimately ministerial approval but uh, to reiterate to Stuart McMillan there are no, currently no proposals to alter those services from the uh, ITU at Inverclyde Royal Hospital and nothing has come to me. Maurice Corrie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the future of Ward 15 has been uncertain since 2011. We support calls for the Cabinet Secretary to step up and take responsibility by making a decision on this proposal. When will staff, patients and families be informed if services are to be moved to the Royal S Hospital for Sick Children? Well, perhaps if the member had listened to my previous answer, he would have heard me say that the decision does lie with me and the process I am undertaking at the moment uh, is to listen to those local parents and concerned uh, people within the area and I'll be undertaking a series of meetings to make sure those uh, views are heard. I would have thought that the member would have welcomed that because surely he wouldn't want me to make a decision without having heard the views of local people. I think that would not be doing his constituents a very good service. Question number six, Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. Can I to ask the Scottish Government how many meetings it has had with production companies since January 2017 regarding locating a new film studio in the Malovian region? Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government has had no meetings. Scottish Enterprise, however, have met with developers about opportunities as part of the ongoing work to ensure that Scotland has an enhanced range of studio facilities. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer? Does she believe we need more than one national film studio in Melovians, and if so, how many? And secondly, will the Scottish Government uh, look at all applications that come forward with equal weight? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we we have committed to supporting a range of studio facilities. Indeed, my initial answer said uh, that we're looking at ongoing work to ensure that Scotland has an enhanced range of studio facilities. So we currently have a number of studios that are used. For example, the Pyramids in Basket was used for train spotting. Livingston facilities was used for Churchill. But it's important that we have permanent facilities, and a number of those are already in development. Um, and we certainly would want to encourage any private sector developer who has an interest in this area to bring forward proposals and our uh, authorities and our public bodies will engage with them. Christine Graham. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Will this, uh, the Cabinet Secretary ensure that any uh, part of the proposed location on the site Mid Lothian takes full account of the traffic pressure on the A701, which is already congested in a bottleneck, with housing developments down that spine, which is causing great difficulties to my constituents, particularly in Pennycook? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as a member might be aware, the planning process isn't fully completed. Uh, the member will understand I can't make any detailed comment. Uh, the reasons for the Minister's proposing to grant planning permission are set out in the Government's letter dated of the 3rd of April, which is public, uh, publicly available, and I would refer the member to that publication. Bruna Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise on what the public sector is doing to make Scotland an attractive place to film productions? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in addition to enhanced uh, studio facilities, we're also making sure that production fund is enhanced on top of the nearly £11 million pounds that Creative Scotland invested in 2015-16. We've also uh, produced a, a production growth fund uh, of £3 million. Pounds. Uh, 1.875 of that has already been awarded. Uh, public, uh, uh, films that have uh, benefited from this production growth fund include Train Spotting, Churchill, Hush, Etruscan Smile, In Plain Sight, uh, Loch Ness and The Wife and the Scotland-based thriller The Keepers starring Gerald Butler will also receive funding to help ensure that Scottish uh, uh, film uh, people can make sure that they can benefit from the opportunities that film have, improving our skills and indeed our capacity for future film opportunities. Thank you. And before we uh, turn to First Minister's questions, members will wish to join me in welcoming to our gallery Mrs Muturam Aras, President of the Parliament of Baden-Württemberg. 